Probability is a beautiful mathematical topic. When you want to prove something about a stochastic system, there are a lot of different tools that you can use. A common kind of thing is to figure out an upper bound on the probability of some kind of event. Another kind of result is to show that if we average over enough random variables, we converge to something that we understand. In this video, we're going to look at some of the basic tools for proving these kinds of results. Our starting point is going to be Markov's inequality. Although very simple to state and prove, it turns out to be the foundation for a lot of other results. Markov's inequality states that if x is a non-negative random variable and a is a scalar greater than zero, then the probability that x is greater than or equal to a is upper bounded by the expectation of x divided by a. To prove this, let's assume without loss of generality that x is a continuous random variable. We start by writing down the definition of the expectation. We can chop this integral up into two pieces. The first integral is from zero to a, and the second integral is from a to infinity. Note that the first integral must be non-negative because it integrates over the product of non-negative functions. So we can think of the second integral as being a lower bound for the expectation of x. Now we know since the lower limit of integration is a, we could replace x with a and get another lower bound. a is just a constant, so it can come out of the integral. Now we recognize that integral as being the probability of the event that x takes a value greater than or equal to a. And we're done. There's Markov's inequality. Now I came up with a visualization to help you understand Markov's inequality, but first I need to tell you about an identity relating to expectations. It's a useful thing to know in any case. If x is a non-negative random variable, then the expectation of x can be computed by integrating 1 minus the CDF from 0 to infinity. First, let's write out what 1 minus the CDF means. It's the probability of the event that the random variable big X takes a value greater than or equal to little x. We can also write that out in terms of the PDF, integrating it from x to infinity. Here I'm writing that integration in terms of a dummy variable z. Now if I take some care, I can change the order of integration. I just need to make sure that the limits correspond to the same region. The function f of z is constant with respect to x, so that inside integral is easy. It turns into z times f of z. Integrating over z, we see that this is computing the expected value of the random variable x. So with that identity in mind, I want to show you a visualization of Markov's inequality. Here I'm showing Markov's inequality with the a on the left side instead of the right side, but it's the same thing. We start off by drawing the CDF of some non-negative random variable. Just a minute ago though, I was telling you that we can compute the expectation from one minus the CDF, so let's plot that now. In particular, we showed that integrating the function one minus the CDF computes the expectation of a non-negative random variable. So this area in blue is the expectation of x. Now, let's choose some arbitrary a for Markov's inequality. If we draw a line up to the curve, then the length of that line is the probability that the random variable x is greater than or equal to a. Now let's look at the inscribed rectangle whose upper right corner is that point. The width of this rectangle is a, and the height is the probability that x takes a value greater than a. So the area of this rectangle is the left side of Markov's inequality as I've written it at the top. And of course the area of any such inscribed rectangle is going to be less than the blue shaded area in this curve. And that's true no matter what a we choose. In Markov's inequality, we take advantage of knowing the mean. Chebyshev's inequality gives tighter bounds if you also know the variance. Chebyshev's inequality says that the probability that a random variable deviates from its mean by more than a is less than the variance of that random variable divided by a squared. Proving Chebyshev's inequality is a more or less direct application of Markov's inequality. You start out by defining a new random variable that is the squared difference between x and its expectation. This new random variable is non-negative, so Markov's inequality applies. It also has the nice property that the expectation of this new random variable y is the variance of x. So we plug in Markov's inequality for this new quantity y using a squared instead of a. Now, of course, the event that y is greater than or equal to a squared is the same as the event that x deviates from its mean by more than a. So we rewrite everything just in terms of x, and we've proved Chebyshev's inequality. Now, it's intuitive that averages of identical and independent random variables converge to their mean. This is a thing that we can formalize in terms of what's called the weak law of large numbers. If we're willing to allow these independent and identically distributed random variables to have a finite mean invariance, then we can use Chebyshev's inequality to show this convergence. Let's imagine that we have a sequence of IID random variables, x1, x2, up to xn, 
and then we take their average and call that yn. Now the expectation of yn is equal to the expectation of any of the individual x's. Let's look at the variance of yn. Now when we multiply a random variable by a scalar and look at its variance, we get the variance of that random variable multiplied by the square of the scalar, and that happens here to the 1 over n term. And the variance of a sum of independent random variables is equal to the sum of the variances. For iid variables, of course, that sum corresponds to just multiplying the variance by n, which cancels out one of the n's in the n squared term. So now we can look at Chebyshev's inequality applied to the difference between yn and the expectation of yn. That is, we can look at the difference between the average of the random variables x and their expectation. Note in particular that we get an n in the denominator of the bound. And this gives us what we want for the weak law of large numbers, which is that the probability of there being any difference between these two quantities goes to zero as n gets large. Now for a couple of the other things that we want to look at here, we need to talk about moment generating functions. You can think of a moment generating function as another way to characterize a distribution. Moment generating functions are close cousins to things like the Laplace transform and the Fourier transform. Like those transforms, the moment generating function is defined in terms of another quantity, t. In particular, it's the expectation of e to the product of t and the random variable x. You can start to see why it's called a moment generating function if you write out the power series for the exponential function. Due to the linearity of expectation, this expectation of an infinite sum becomes an infinite sum of expectations. The kth term contains the kth moment. This means that you can compute the kth moment of the random variable x by taking the kth derivative of the moment generating function and evaluating it at zero. Moment generating functions are useful for a variety of reasons, but one of the main things that we like is that if you have a sum of random variables, that corresponds to the product of the moment generating functions. This is a lot easier than manipulating the probability density functions in which sums would correspond to a convolution. So this duality between convolution and a pointwise product is another analogy with things like the Fourier transform. Additionally, scaling a random variable corresponds to just scaling the argument to the moment generating function. We're going to use the moment generating function in order to sketch out a proof for the celebrated central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us that sums of random variables with finite mean and variance converge to the Gaussian distribution. Amazingly, this is true no matter what distribution the original random variables have. In this visualization, I'm illustrating the phenomenon. Each of these balls, as it moves down, is taking equally probable steps to the left and to the right. These steps are independent, so how far the ball makes it to the left or to the right is a sum of independent random variables. I'll slow down the animation for a minute so you can see what's going on. When the balls reach the bottom, they're accumulated into a histogram that's being updated continuously. I'm hoping you can convince yourself that this histogram starts to look like a Gaussian distribution as the animation proceeds. So I'd like to sketch out a proof for the central limit theorem phenomenon. Let's imagine that we have a sequence of identically and independently distributed random variables with zero mean and variance sigma squared. The zero mean is just to make it easier to explain. Let's define the random variable Sn to be the average of the x's. What the central limit theorem says is that the random variable Sn multiplied by the square root of n converges in distribution to the normal distribution here with zero mean and variance sigma squared. When I say converge in distribution, what I'm saying is that as n gets large, all of the measurable events associated with the random variable Sn multiplied by the square root of n converge to have the same probability as they would if they were from a Gaussian random variable. I'm following convention by denoting this kind of convergence via an arrow with a d over it for distribution. We can start our proof sketch by writing out the moment generating function for the random variables xi. We immediately know the first three terms of the series because the mean is zero and the variance is sigma squared. Now recall that when we sum random variables, we can just take the product of their moment generating functions, or in this case, raise the moment generating function to the power of n. The two scaling factors one over n and root n give us one over root n, and this just scales the argument to the moment generating function. Now let's write that out in terms of the quantities we know. What we want to reason about here is the limit of this moment generating function as n goes to infinity. The key thing to realize is this looks like one form of the exponential function. That is, the limit of the quantity 1 plus x over n to the power of n as n goes to infinity is e to the x. 
the other terms in the sum go to zero faster than one over n as n goes to infinity. So the contribution of those higher order moments gets washed out by the contributions from the first and second moment. And then finally, we see that the limit itself is the moment generating function of a zero mean Gaussian distribution with variance sigma squared. And that's the result that we're after. Having learned about moment generating functions and the Markov inequality, we can now talk about a useful inequality called the Chernoff bound. You can actually think of it as a family of inequalities parameterized by the same t that we saw in the moment generating function. So what it does is gives us the freedom to choose any t we want to minimize the bound as long as the moment generating function exists for that t. Really, this is just a way to get tighter bounds by making more aggressive assumptions about the random variable of interest. Just like Chebyshev's inequality is tighter than Markov's because it assumes a finite variance, here we're making even more general assumptions about moments. Even though this looks like a pretty complicated inequality, the proof is simple. We start out by considering the probability of the event that x is greater than epsilon. Now if I multiply both sides of the inequality by a non-negative factor t, and then exponentiate the result, I get the same event. And because now I've created a non-negative random variable, I can apply Markov's inequality. And this is true for any t greater than zero for which that expectation exists. And note that the numerator on the right-hand side is just the moment generating function. Since this is true for any valid t, we can choose t to minimize the bound. One interesting thing is that we can use the same trick to apply it symmetrically. Consider the event x is less than negative epsilon. I can multiply both sides by negative t, flip the inequality, and then exponentiate. I still wind up with the same event. I can apply Markov's inequality again, and I get a bound that's valid for any t. The Chernoff bound turns out to be a powerful tool in the area of computational learning theory, because the moment generating functions interact nicely with sums like you would get if you were computing a loss over a set of training data. The last inequality is a thing we've looked at before, and it's called Jensen's inequality. Jensen's inequality is a real workhorse for lots of kinds of probabilistic machine learning and deep learning. Jensen's inequality focuses on expectations of convex functions. Here's an example of such a function in orange. Now let's imagine that there's some distribution on the x-axis. A distribution on the y-axis would be induced by pushing random variables x through the convex function fx. Now consider the value of the function evaluated at the expectation of x. Compare that to the expectation of the induced distribution on the y-axis. If the function is convex, then the expectation of f of x will always be greater than or equal to the function applied to the expectation of x. So that gives you a geometric idea of what we're up to, but let's look at a proof. I got this version of the proof from some notes by Larry Wasserman. Let's imagine evaluating the function at the expectation of x. If the function is differentiable at that point, then let's fit a line to the tangent. If it's not differentiable, then choose your favorite subderivative. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it and just assume that the function is differentiable. Let's call that line g of x. So g of x touches f of x at the expectation of x. But otherwise, because f of x is convex, it is everywhere above g of x. Now, because f of x is greater than or equal to g of x pointwise, the expectation of f of x must also be greater than the expectation of g of x. Now let's write out the form of g of x. Now we apply the linearity of expectation, and we see that what we're doing is evaluating g of x at the expectation of x. But of course, we constructed the functions to touch at this point. So this quantity is also equal to f applied at the expectation of x. And now we're done. We've proven Jensen's inequality. Now I know this has been a pretty dense video, but these are important tools to be aware of. They come up over and over again when we try to reason about problems in statistics and machine learning. 